Scarface, The World is Yours is a 2006 open-world action-adventure video game developed by Radical Entertainment for PlayStation 2, Xbox and Windows published by Vivendi Games. In 2007, a version with enhanced graphics was released for the Wii. An Xbox 360 version was also being developed, but was cancelled. The game is not a direct adaptation of the 1983 film directed by Brian De Palma, but is instead a pseudo sequel which changes the ending of the film so that Tony Montana, originally played by Al Pacino, survives, and sets about exacting revenge on those who ousted him from power by re establishing his drug empire in Miami. The game features Al Pacino's likeness in the character of Montana, but Pacino does not voice the character, as he and the game's producers felt his voice had changed too much since 1983. Instead, Montana is voiced by Andre Soliuzzo, who was personally selected by Pacino himself. Actors from the original film who did voice work for the game include Stephen Bauer, Robert Lodger and Al Israel. The game received mixed to positive reviews, with many critics comparing it favorably to both 2002's Grand Theft Auto, Vice City which itself was influenced by the Scarface film and 2004's Grand Theft Auto, San Andreas. It was also praised for maintaining the tone of the film, for its humor, and for the accuracy of the depiction of Montana himself. The game was also a commercial success, selling over one and a half million units across all platforms. Topic: Gameplay. Scarface is an open-world action-adventure game played from a third-person perspective, in which the player controls Tony Montana as he attempts to regain control of Miami's drug trade, destroy rival gangs, and restore his own reputation in the criminal underworld. <laughs> Combat The basic gameplay and game mechanics fall into the subgenre of Grand Theft Auto clones. As such, Montana can commandeer vehicles, cars and boats, can move around the map on foot, can interact with civilians and NPCs both hostile and non-hostile, can engage in primary and sub-missions, and can wield a variety of weaponry, pistols, submachine guns, shotguns, assault rifles, a sniper rifle, a rocket launcher, a chainsaw, and various melee weapons, such as pipes and machetes. In a departure from most Grand Theft Auto style games, Montana cannot kill innocent people. If the player tries to shoot a non aggressive target, Montana will refuse. If the player tries to hit an innocent person with a car, they will only be injured. However, as the game progresses, the player acquires access to some of Montana's employees a driver, a boat pilot, a weapons dealer, an enforcer, and an assassin. When these employees have been unlocked, the player can switch control from Montana to any one of them except the weapons dealer, and when playing as the enforcer or the assassin, the player can kill innocent people. When shooting, the player can lock on to the enemy or can aim manually, hitting specific body parts to produce different reactions. For example, if Montana shoots an opponent in the leg, they will fall down, but will continue to fire. If he hits an opponent in the arm, they will remain on their feet, but their aim will be compromised. Hitting opponents by aiming manually earns Montana more «balls» than using the lock-on system. Earning balls fills the «balls meter», which is an essential component of combat in the game. Once the meter is full, «blind rage» mode becomes available. In this mode, the game switches to first person and goes into slow motion, aim becomes automatic, the player acquires infinite ammo and doesn't have to reload their weapon, and each enemy killed earns Montana health. Montana can also acquire balls by taunting defeated opponents, insulting drivers who have hit his car, winning street races, completing missions, and having conversations with random people. Um, 
Topic: <laughs> Empire. There are four main geographical regions which Montana must control to complete the game: Little Havana, Downtown, South Beach, and North Beach. At the start of the game, the entire map is available to explore, but Montana cannot carry out missions, attack rival gangs or purchase property anywhere except Little Havana. Each turf must be controlled 100% before the next one becomes available for missions. Acquiring 100% requires the player to perform certain actions within each region, purchase a certain number of fronts, eliminate rival gangs and carry out smaller missions involving purchasing and selling cocaine. To purchase fronts, Montana must perform a mission for the owner before they will sell the business to him. These missions, coupled with storyline missions, form the core of the main game. Once purchased, fronts can come under attack from rival gangs. To combat this, Montana can install security cameras to alert him to an imminent attack and guards to fend off attackers until he arrives on the scene. Once he has purchased the requisite number of fronts in a region, he must then take control of that region's storehouse, which will be in the possession of a rival gang. A major part of the gameplay is reputation. There are eight reputation levels each level represented by a letter in the word Scarface, and certain items and missions cannot be unlocked until the player has reached a certain reputation level. Reputation can be increased by various means, such as completing missions and buying fronts, completing side missions, and buying exotics, extras used to decorate Montana's mansion. Rising in reputation and increasing Montana's balls count also unlocks femme fatales. If Montana can persuade these women to come to his mansion, they will give him stat increases, such as higher stamina. The foundation of Montana's empire is dealing cocaine. To acquire cocaine to sell, players must complete side missions called Felix Leads. These involve Montana carrying out a mission for his contact Felix. Upon successfully completing the mission, Felix will put Montana in touch with a cocaine supplier, from whom Montana can purchase cocaine. If it is a small supplier, Montana can only purchase a certain amount of grams, which can be sold directly to street dealers or distributed through fronts. However, if it is large supplier. Montana can purchase kilos, which must be transferred to a storehouse. He must then go on a drug run, distributing cocaine to all of his fronts in a single mission, whilst being pursued by rival gang members. Later in the game, Montana can purchase larger amounts of cocaine from Caribbean islands to the south of Miami, which he must then get back to the mainland via boat, avoiding pirates and the Coast Guard, before distributing the drugs amongst his fronts via a drug run. <laughs> Money and heat Montana has access to two different types of money in the game. Cash on hand is called, "...dirty money", if the player dies, is arrested or is shaken down by another gang, the player will lose all their dirty money. The only way to protect Montana's money, and ensure it is not lost when the player dies, is to launder it in a bank. The player is free to launder money at a bank any time they wish except during missions, but each time they launder cash, the bank will take a cut of the total. The percentage of their cut is determined by the level of cop heat. Montana currently has the higher his heat, the higher their cut. Cop heat and gang heat are two meters which are active at all times during the game. Cop heat determines the rate of interest at banks, and gang heat determines the price of cocaine. The more heat, the less Montana can charge. If Montana, or any of his associates, engages in a lot of public violence, cop heat will rise, and the police will arrive, pursuing Montana. Cop heat can be lowered with bribes, and gang heat can be lowered by intimidating other gangs. 
if Montana continues to commit open crimes, cop heat can rise to the point where Montana enters, "'You're fucked' mode, in which he cannot escape from the police alive. A "'golf swing' style minigame, where the player must attempt to stop the meter in a certain zone, is used to control negotiating drug deals, intimidating other gangs and bribing cops. Topic. Plot The game begins during the final scene of the film, with Tony Montana's voiced by Andre Soliuzzo mansion under attack from assassins sent by Alejandro Sosa, Robert Davi. Unlike in the film, however, Montana is able to evade Sosa's men and escape the grounds, just as the D and Miami Dade police arrive. Sosa then receives a call from one of his men, who says Tony's mansion is on fire and being seized by law enforcement, his drug empire reduced to nothing, and he is confident Tony is dead. Meanwhile, hiding in a safe house in the Miami Glades, Tony laments the deaths of his friend Manny and sister Gina, chastises himself for not listening to the advice of others due to his bull-headedness, determines to quit cocaine, and vows revenge on Sosa. Three months later, Tony returns to Miami. All of his assets have been frozen, and the districts of Miami he used to dominate have been divided among other drug cartels. His first act is to ask George Sheffield James Woods to become his lawyer again. Sheffield reluctantly agrees, but at higher wages than before. As Tony has no real power anymore, he has little choice. He next travels to see his old friend and contact Felix Carlos Ferro, who tells him Sosa is working with Gaspar Gomez Cheech Marin in an effort to take over all of Tony's old turf. He also warns Tony that there are very few dealers who can be trusted anymore, as most report back to Sosa. Tony says he needs to make some small deals so he can make enough money to buy his mansion back from the Vice Squad, and begin to rebuild his empire. Felix advises him to speak to a bartendress named Coco Nika Futterman. She puts him in touch with some dealers, as he slowly begins to re-establish his name, earning enough to repurchase his mansion. He calls Felix, who tells him that he thinks Gaspar is smuggling cash. Tony steals one of Gaspar's trucks, carrying $50,000, and uses it to open a bank account. Reconnecting with his old banker, Jerry Michael York, Montana uses the bank to launder his money as he sets out to reclaim control of Little Havana from the Diaz brothers. As Tony's reputation increases, the brothers attempt to have him killed. He survives the assassination attempt, and one of the killers tells him the Diazes have murdered his mother. Killing them both in retaliation, he regains control of Little Havana. Tony then gets a call from Pablo Wilma Valderrama, an associate of Sheffield's. He tells Tony they have information regarding the location of Tony's estranged wife, Elvira, and he arranges to meet. However, the meet is a set-up. Tony escapes and kills Pablo, realizing that Sheffield has turned against him. Meanwhile, he sets about taking control of downtown from the Contreras cartel. Upon doing so, he is contacted by the Sandman Stephen Bauer, a cocaine producer from the Caribbean islands south of Miami. Sandman also wants Sosa out of the picture, and he invites Tony to come to see him. They agree that with Tony in Miami selling Sandman's product from the islands, they can run Sosa out of business. Tony then meets Venus Cree Summer, Sandman's ex-girlfriend and a powerful influence on the islands herself. She tells him of the owner of a nearby casino, being run on a disused oil tanker, who is killing women and dumping their bodies overboard, and asks Tony if he can take care of it. The man turns out to be Nacho Contreras, formerly in control of downtown's drug trade. Tony travels to the casino and kills Nacho. He next sets about taking control of South Beach and North Beach, both of which are controlled by Gaspar Gomez. 
Upon doing so, he is contacted by the Sandman, who tells him he is going to war with the Colombian drug cartels. However, the Colombians get word of Sandman's plan and attack his plantation. Tony helps defend it, but Sandman tells him the Colombians have taken over his processing lab on the island of Tranquilandia, and are holding the workers hostage. Tony heads there, killing the Colombians and rescuing the hostages. Upon returning, the Sandman sells Tony his plantation, meaning Tony is now in charge of production and distribution, making him the most powerful drug lord in the vicinity and allowing him to finally go after Sosa, who is in Bolivia. At his mansion, Sosa is hosting a meeting with Sheffield and Gomez in which they are discussing how best to get rid of Tony. From outside, they hear an explosion, as Tony attacks the house. Fighting his way through the grounds, he kills Sosa's security people, before shooting and killing Sheffield. Heading further into the estate, he kills Gomez. Eventually, he confronts Sosa, who tells Tony he warned him not to betray him, but Tony did, referring to the planned assassination of a journalist which Tony refused to carry out because there were children in the journalist's car. Sosa says that in their business, sometimes children have to be killed. Tony then kills him. As he leaves the mansion, Tony finds one of Sosa's men still alive. The survivor begs for his life, and Tony offers him a job. The game ends with Sosa's surviving henchmen working as Tony's butler, as Tony and Venus watch television in a jacuzzi. Feeling good about his life, Tony declares he finally has what he always felt was coming to him, the world. <laughs> <laughs> development The game was first announced on August 10, 2004, when Vivendi Universal Games revealed Radical Entertainment were working on a third-person shooter adaptation of the film for PC and several, as yet unnamed, current-generation consoles, with a projected release date in the third quarter of 2005. Writing. Originally, the developers had intended to do a straight adaptation of the film. However, they quickly concluded that doing so presented two inherent problems, the original screenplay was so good, they felt it couldn't be replicated in a gaming environment, and because Montana dies at the end, they felt players would not want to invest in developing a character that they knew was doomed from the beginning. As such, they decided the game would tell an original story, set after the film. Jason Bone, combat designer on the game, explained, "...we didn't want to rehash the movie because we feel that to make a good game, there needs to be a compelling storyline with good characters that drive you through it. There have been a lot of games that have been made based on movies, and when they follow the exact storyline of the movie, you lose a little bit of interest if you know where things are going. We felt that a fresh start would allow us to have the freedom to do new and interesting things to keep the player motivated and engaged." They originally asked Oliver Stone, the film's screenwriter, if he would be interested in working on the script, but when Stone declined, they approached David McKenna, writer of the film's American History X and Blow. As a fan of the film, McKenna wanted to emphasize the over-the-top humor he perceived in the character of Montana. Shortly after the game had been released, IGN interviewed McKenna, asking him exactly how much of the game's 40,000 lines of dialogue he wrote. McKenna stated, I did work a lot on this thing. It was a pain in the ass. I didn't know what I was getting myself into. I didn't know anything about ancillary scenes, about how the character can go in different directions, he has to have a line of dialogue for every single character he encounters. I'm not a video game guy, I don't play video games. I put a lot of time into this but I only put, you know, several months. 
Radical put in several years, these guys were working on this thing forever. I gave them the best blueprint I could. I helped them as much as I could with dialogue, ancillary scenes, I helped guide them as much as I could but in the end it's their baby. It was their world, I was just living in it for a little while. At the decision to change the end of the film so that Montana survives, McKenna dismissed critics who said the game was disrespecting the film and undermining the moral aspect of its narrative. Get a life. It's a fucking game. We had fun continuing on with it and taking a great character, having him survive at the end and reclaim his empire. I thought that was a good way to continue on the story. I wanted to kick off the game with Tony sitting in the tub, talking to a group of movie studio executives. He's saying, Why does the bad guy have to always die at the end? Well, fuck you. You die. And then he pulls out a machine gun and blows them all away. And then he escapes from the mansion. But Vivendi Universal wouldn't do it. But the whole thing, it's a game, it's a joke. The people understand that I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel here with Scarface or do any destruction to the movie, it's one of my favorites. It's just having fun with something. He further commented, What I did, I wanted to take that to the next level. It is a video game. People who are going to say, Hey, he fucked with the movie, that's being ridiculous. I wanted to have fun and kind of create something on my own, while sticking to the same tone and flavor of the flick. People want to laugh when they're playing a game, and I just wanted to take advantage of that. Topic. Development and delay In December 2004, Vivendi announced the game would be released for PlayStation 2 and Xbox, as well as the already announced PC release. The game was first shown as a non playable demo at the 2005 GDC in March when it was revealed it was no longer a third person shooter, but was now a GTA style open world game. Vivendi stated the game would be non-linear, with players free to do missions in whichever order they wish, with an estimated playtime of 50 to 60 hours. Vivendi also made a point that Montana would be unable to kill innocent people in the game. Producer Cam Weber explained the concept of Rage Mode, which was on show in the demo, was very much inspired by the film. For fans of the movie, you'll remember that Tony has this crazy temper that every once in a while gets set off. You hear the organ music play, you see a camera cut to the intensity in his eyes, and he just suddenly snaps. He loses it, he completely loses control and does some really violent things. In April, Vivendi revealed the title of the game would be Scarface, The World Is Yours, and while it would feature Al Pacino's likeness, Pacino himself would not be voicing Montana. While it was not announced who was voicing the role, multiple other cast members were revealed, Stephen Bauer, Robert Lodger, Jay Moore, Cheech Marin, James Woods, Miguel Sandoval, Robert Davy, Michael Rappaport, and Michael York. Vivendi's chief strategy and marketing officer, Cindy Cook stated, "...Al Pacino brought the character of Tony Montana to life on screen in a very powerful way, and the inclusion of his likeness as Tony Montana is a critical component to the authenticity of the Scarface game experience." We are also thrilled to have other top-notch talent involved with Scarface, The World Is Yours, as their participation will add further substance and depth to the characters featured in the game." In May, Vivendi announced the game's release had been pushed back to 2006. In the same statement, they revealed the game was being developed for the Xbox 360 as well as the PS2, Xbox and PC. The Xbox version of the game was first made available in playable form albeit not playable by the public at E3 2005 in May. 
Radical stated the PC and PlayStation 2 versions would be identical to the Xbox version, although the Xbox 360 version would have some unique features. Redesign In late March 2006, Vivendi gave pre-alpha builds of the PlayStation 2 version of the game to both IGN and GameSpot. They explained that since E3 2005, Radical had given the entire game an overhaul, improving the design and creating a more compelling storyline. They had also tweaked the gameplay in an effort to appeal to both casual gamers and more hardcore gamers. These changes had been implemented after some negative feedback from both the public and the gaming press following the E3 demo. Writers had been especially critical of the look of the game, and one of Radical's alterations was to repaint every external texture. Jason Bone stated the negative feedback was a good thing, as Radical had underestimated the difficulty of making a large open-world game. We do have a bit of experience with open world games, but they were on a much smaller scale, there wasn't a lot of detail in them. With this game, we needed it to feel cinematic and yet be an open world game. The negative feedback made them realize the game needed more work. Bone also stated work had not begun on the Xbox 360 version, as they didn't want it to be a direct port, nor did they want it to distract them from the PS2, PC and Xbox versions. He also suggested that a PlayStation 3 version was under consideration. The alpha build of the game was shown by Vivendi at the pre-E3 2006 show in April. Vivendi also released another list of voice actors who were appearing in the game, Al Israel, Ice-T, Oliver Platt, Daniel Day Kim, Willa Holland, Roma Mafia, Robert Lozado, Brenda Strong, Dale Earnhardt Jr., Ricky Gervais, Michael Rooker, Jason Mewes, Anthony Anderson, Rick Yoon, Wilma Valderrama, Kevin Dillon, Jerry Ferrara, Richard Roundtree, Tiny Lister Jr., Bai Ling, Bam Margera, Cree Summer, N.O.R.E. Tommy Lee, Be Real, Sen Dog and Elliot Gould. It was also revealed the actor voicing Montana, Andre Soliuzzo, had been hand-picked by Al Pacino. In July, it was revealed Pacino had turned down the opportunity to lend his likeness to Electronic Arts' Godfather adaptation so he could appear instead in Scarface. It was also explained the reason Pacino himself was not voicing Montana was because he simply didn't sound like Montana anymore. According to Vivendi's Adam Roberts, "...he just can't physically do it anymore. He tried, but it took a lot of physical effort to do the Montana voice, it's very heavily accented, very difficult for him to do." In August, a collector's edition of the game for the PlayStation 2 was announced, which would include the game, a bonus DVD including a making of documentary, a video walkthrough with producer commentary, cast interviews, hints and tips, a full map of the game world and concept art. Topic: <laughs> PSP version On July 28, Vivendi announced a Scarface game was also being developed for the PlayStation Portable. However, it would be a completely different game from The World Is Yours. Called Scarface, Money. Power. Respect, the game was being developed by Farsight Studios, and would combine turn-based strategy with real-time combat as rival gangs vie to take control of Miami. On the same day, Vivendi also revealed the Xbox 360 version of The World Is Yours had been cancelled, for undisclosed reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Music 
In August, Vivendi revealed the 100 song plus soundtrack would feature music from the likes of Debbie Harry, Public Enemy, Run DMC, Judas Priest, Rick James, Grandmaster Flash, Peter Tosh, Beth Anderson, Burning Spear, Iggy Pop, Control Machete, and Johnny Cash, as well as the entirety of Giorgio Moroder's original score for the film. They also revealed details of the mixtape feature, which would allow players to customize the in-game soundtrack in any way they wished. Cindy Cook, chief marketing officer at Vivendi, stated, Throughout the development process we have focused on giving the player the power to choose their own in-game music experience, whether it be the Scarface purist that wants only the film score, the player that wants authentic music from the time period or the fan that craves the hottest tracks from today's talent. We are able to offer this choice through our new mixtape music mixer and an incredible lineup of 1980s and contemporary artists that are bringing their hits to the game. Generations of film fans and gamers will be able to create an experience that best suits their unique tastes. The game's soundtrack, Scarface, The World Is Yours, original game music score, composed by Mark Barrell, was released by Universal Music in October 2006. The track features no music from the film, only original music from the game. Topic. Wii version In January, 2007, Nama revealed The World Is Yours was being ported to the Wii. On March 1, Vivendi confirmed the game was scheduled for a summer release, and would be identical to the other versions, but would feature Wii remote controls and enhanced graphics. The game was first shown on April 10, at which time the controls were demonstrated. IGN were impressed. The pointing function works really well in Scarface. Just like the PC version's mouse control, players now have near pinpoint weapon precision that makes it easier and more intuitive to gun down the opposition with the huge assortment of firepower within the experience. You can still target individuals to tighten up your aim using the Z button on the nunchuck, but because the Wii Remote's pointer already does a great job with its precision it's rare that we found ourselves using it." GameSpot were less impressed. When you're wielding the chainsaw, its movement will be tied to that of the Wii Remote, and by slashing in different directions and at different heights you'll be able to target enemies' heads, legs, and individual arms. With practice you'll purportedly be able to remove all of the aforementioned extremities before the torso hits the ground, but the associate producer showing us the game on this occasion never managed to pull it off. Vivendi also confirmed the game would be entirely uncut, making it the most violent game available for the Wii. It was later announced the economy in the game had been adjusted to give players greater rewards for earlier missions, and the price of some of the exotics had been lowered. Reception The World Is Yours received generally positive reviews across all systems. The PlayStation 2 version holds an aggregate score of 75 out of 100 on Metacritic, based on 46 reviews. The Xbox version 76 out of 100, based on 41 reviews. The PC version 73 out of 100, based on 18 reviews. And the Wii version 71 out of 100, based on 23 reviews. IGN's Chris Roper was extremely impressed, scoring the PC, PlayStation 2 and Xbox versions 8.7 out of 10, and giving the game an «Editor's Choice» award. The Xbox version was also awarded the October «Xbox Game of the Month» award. Roper dismissed notions that the game was simply a Grand Theft Auto clone, arguing instead that it advanced the genre. Much of Scarface is based on what we've seen in Grand Theft Auto. 
In fact, it's fairly obvious that Radical used said series as the blueprint and then went back and re-evaluated its shortcomings. The result is that we have a game that fixes many of GTA's problematic elements." He praised the basic gameplay, the storyline, the balls meter, rage mode, and the aiming system. Although he was somewhat critical of the map, arguing too many areas in the game are accessible via only one road, he concluded, "...there are a whole lot of little things about Scarface that make it fun, but it's the sum of its parts that make it the overall great game that it is. It does a whole lot to fix many of the problems with other games in the genre, and it does an absolutely fantastic job of bringing the world of Scarface to gamers." Mark Bozen and Chris Roper scored the Wii version 8.5 out of 10, also giving it an «Editor's Choice» award, and writing, «Scarface is a very impressive game, and while there isn't a ton of Wii-specific additions to the package, everything that was added makes a big difference». Praising the controls, they wrote, it's amazingly easy to target enemies and blow off specific body parts in the process." They called it, "...an intelligent, high-budget, astonishingly impressive game," arguing, "...we owners that fit in the hardcore crowd will absolutely eat this one up, as it's currently one of the deepest and most entertaining experiences on the system." Game Informer's Matt Helgeson scored the PlayStation 2 version 8.5 out of 10, calling it, "...a very playable and addictive open-world game that manages to put its own fresh spin on the familiar genre." He was critical of the side missions, calling them, "...very repetitive," but he concluded, "...overall, I had a great time with Scarface." It's every bit as profane, violent, and over the top as the movie, and delivers not only the gunplay you're expecting, but as much depth as almost any other game in the genre. Gamespy's Justin Spear scored the PlayStation 2 version 4 out of 5, calling it a ridiculously violent, unbelievably profane game that lets you glorify yourself with virtual millions of dollars in hard-earned drug money, fast cars, boats, underlings, women and copious amounts of blood. It's a good feeling. Quote. However, he noted that Gamers who are getting used to the next generation of console visuals aren't going to be impressed with either the PS2 or the Xbox version. Quote. He also argued the game becomes somewhat repetitive towards the end. However, he concluded, Scarface is a long-lasting experience that's simply a lot of fun. Part guilty pleasure, part blazingly successful experiment in game design, Scarface, The World Is Yours is definitely worth a shot. Eurogamer's Kristen Reed scored the Xbox version 7 out of 10, calling it a surprisingly well put together take on the genre, with his biggest criticism being the semi-linear nature of the gameplay. He concluded, Scarface is only ever a fun, solid competent Grand Theft also ran and never a classic. Scarface is certainly several notches above the derivative insult we expected it would be, and those who can bear to wait another year for the next GTA will be well served by its faithfulness to the popular formula. Groundbreaking it isn't, but fun it is. Dan Whitehead also scored the Wii version 7 out of 10. Of the control system, he wrote. It's not that the new control system is unworkable, just that it's a fairly needless change dictated by the Wii itself rather than gameplay necessity. It's fiddly to learn, often awkward to use when it matters most, yet doesn't reward you with any tangible benefits when you master it." Quote. He concluded, Given the drought currently afflicting the Wii, it seems churlish to completely dismiss Scarface's many amusements just because of control issues, especially as they can be accommodated with patience and practice. For the bulk of its playing time Scarface remains an indecently entertaining bad taste romp.
GameSpot's Jeff Gerstmann was less impressed, scoring the PC version 6 out of 10, the PS2 version 6.4 out of 10 and the Xbox version 6.6 .6 out of 10, and calling the game a foul-mouthed and bloody adventure that does next to nothing with the characters. The whole experience feels flat and often self-conscious. Of the PC version, he wrote, even on machines that go way beyond the game's recommended system requirements, we noticed plenty of frame rate trouble and slowdown. The textures aren't pretty, and overall, the game looks like a quick and dirty console port. Quote, he concluded, Overall, Scarface, The World is Yours is more a victim of some poor design choices than any glaring technical issues. By taking the focus off of the gameplay elements that you'd want in an open city game and putting it more on the game's bland mission design and all the dull side tasks you'll have to do to earn a reputation, Scarface doesn't play to its potential strengths. The end result is a functional game that presents an interesting premise, but underneath you'll find a wholly uninteresting game." Quote, he was even more critical of the Wii version, scoring at 5.8 out of 10, writing, The gamepad to Wii Remote Transition has made this lackluster game play even worse. Quote, he was extremely critical of the controls. While it's somewhat impressive on some level that the developer managed to cram a standard gamepad-controlled game onto the Wii Remote and Nunchuck, it's never fun to play, and you'll feel like you're fighting the controls from start to finish. The editors of Computer Games magazine presented Scarface with their 2006 Best Soundtrack Award. Topic. Sales Scarface sold well on PlayStation 2 and Xbox, but not on PC. In its first week on Best Buy, the PlayStation 2 version was the second highest selling game, the Collector's Edition was the 8 and the Xbox version was the 13th. Together, the two PS2 versions outsold the number one game that week, Tiger Woods PGA Tour 07. By the end of October, the game was the top selling game of the month. The combined regular and collector's editions on the PS2 was the best selling game in North America in October, with over 366,000 units sold, earning over $18.7 million. The Xbox version sold over 110,000 units, earning over $5.4 million. The PC version sold only 9,000 units, earning less than $450,000. By the end of November, the game had sold over 1 million copies worldwide across all three systems. By March 2007, the PlayStation and Xbox versions had sold over 1.5 million copies between them. In Germany, the game was banned for high impact violence and cruelty. Topic: Cancelled sequels. In July 2005, Vivendi president Phil O'Neill intimated there were plans to turn Scarface into a multi-game franchise, saying, "A Scarface 2, a Scarface 3, a Scarface 4, and consecutive iterations of that product are a really important component of what we're trying to do here." When the rights to the property were transferred to Activision Blizzard in 2008, however, Scarface 2 was not included in their list of upcoming games. Although the rights were later transferred back to Vivendi, no further news was heard. <laughs> 